making the most of your marines. Having grasped the basic techniques of figure painting and gloriously covered your multitude of orcs in varying shades of bilious green, it's now time to look to the future and get your sable around some of Citadel's chunky new plastic space marines. Listen on. Space marines have to fight in a vast range of alien environments and their camouflage schemes vary to reflect this fact. There are also a number of marine units or chapters who have their own easily identifiable uniforms. Some of these are given as examples in the book, but you are free to create your own designs. Like all miniature figures, your space marines will have to be prepared correctly if the results are to be worthwhile. Make sure you have all the usual tools to hand, a modelling knife or scalpel, a selection of needle files, good brushes, cleaning equipment and adhesive. The first step is to take the sprues from the box and wash the figure parts in a mild solution of detergent. This will remove any of the mould lubricant remaining on the plastic. If you don't do this, the paint won't adhere to the figure properly and your masterful work will soon look extremely tacky. The parts can then be removed from the sprue with a sharp scalpel, ready for assembly. Don't try to twist the parts off with your fingers as you'll almost certainly end up breaking the more delicate pieces. And mind your fingers when cutting bits free, unless you want blood-stained armour patterns. The pieces can now be trimmed with files or a modelling knife to remove mould lines or bits of sprue. Before you start gluing things together, it's a good idea to stick a figure together with bits of blue tack or something similar. The figures have been designed to offer a variety of poses, and if you experiment first, you can get a good idea of how you would like the finished model to look. There are several kinds of modelling cement available, from tube adhesives to liquid cement. Make sure you use a proper plastic modelling glue. Don't try sticking these things together with Evo stick or rubber cement, or you will end up in a real mess. Tube cements are rather thick and stringy. They're not the easiest of glues to use on models as small as these. However, with a little practice, they can be made to double as a body filler for small areas, and if you read how Ali Morrison made his figures, you'll see that tube glue is more flexible than you might think. More popular though is liquid cement, available in small bottles from hobby shops. These bottles last a long time and every last drop of glue is usable, so they're good value for money. A brush applicator is fitted to the inside of the cap. It's pretty crude, but it does its job well enough. Liquid cement works by melting the surface of the plastic and welding bits together. It's strong and easy to apply. Whichever glue you choose, small amounts need to be applied to the areas of both parts to be joined. Join the pieces together, applying just a little pressure as you do so before leaving the join to dry. Liquid cement dries much more quickly than its tubed counterpart. Remember not to use too much glue. A good join is where both parts make good contact and are given time to dry. Too much tube glue will turn into an elastic goo that doesn't have any strength, warps the proportions of your figure and almost inevitably leads to unsightly stringing as you draw your tacky paws away. On the other hand, apply too much liquid cement and you can end up melting the surface detail on the model. Once the models have been built, they can be painted. Fine sable brushes are the best choice for this. 
A bad workman might blame his tools, but when it comes to modelling brushes, poor quality leads inevitably to poor results. So I think carefully before buying. Size 0 and 1 brushes will be suitable for undercoating and adding most of the detail. Painting insignia is more difficult. Triple zero or double zero size brushes with medium to long points will be necessary for any really detailed work here. But before you rush off and start hacking into your models, take a look at what some of the people here at the studio have done to their figures. It might give you a few ideas for conversions, painting techniques, camouflage schemes and insignia. Nick Bibby's Dark Angel Marines involved several conversions. The rocket launcher equipped Marine was the first to suffer some butchery at Nick's scalpel blade. Two sets of legs were hacked apart, swapped around and refixed with glue and body putty. This changed the figure's stance considerably, resulting in a rigidly upright pose that emphasised the Marine's careful aiming. The conical helmet nose was also cut off and rebuilt with putty to create a menacing grid-like face mask. Conversions don't have to involve such detail to be effective. Another of Nick's marines took on deadly proportions when its hand was sawn off and replaced with one of the blades from a bolter. Another pistol packet brother was simply given a spare bolter in his other hand. The resulting impression was the same, someone you wouldn't want to mess with. Putting these ideas together, Nick replaced another marine's hand with one of the spare pistols and added a grenade launcher to the top of the bolter. Finally, another facial alteration appeared in the form of a skull mask. This was created, created by removing the nose, filing the faceplate and adding a part of a skull from the plastic skeleton set. Nick's marines were given a group identity by adding skull faces to their shoulder pads. These were created in the same fashion as the faceplate. A three-dimensional chapter insignia adds to the effect considerably. A useful tip from this ace sculptor, removal of the shoulder pins allows flexibility in the positioning of the arms. All Nick's figures were given a black undercoat with a second coat of black for the base body colour. This was dry brushed dark red with the weapons painted dark grey and dry brushed with a lighter shade. For a particularly enigmatic and original feel, Nick retouched the edges of armour with orange crayon and the weapons with grey crayon. The unit's insignia was painted in gouache, which was black lined for the finishing touch. A word of warning, a steady hand and a fluid mix of paint are both absolute musts for getting this sort of detail to look good. If you're not confident, practice on sheets of white card or paper. Remember to use your finest brushes. Alternatively, you can use artists' rapidograph pens. These can be ideal, but they do have their limitations. They only come in black, and the thinnest point that you can buy is a 0 0.013, which is still not as fine as a really good brush. Unless you're careful, it's also possible for the ink to flood into the paint. The group's banner was made from the foil from the rim of a wine bottle, cut and attached to soldered lengths of wire that formed the upright and cross piece. The banner was raggedly cut and punched with small holes to give the effect of battle damage. The bird perched on the top of the banner was scratch built from body putty and the heads adorning the cross piece were predictably taken from the plastic skeleton range. The whole structure was painted with red gouache and dusted with black and dark brown crayon powder before the final varnishing was applied. Even more esoteric were Dave Andrews' conversions. Dave created all of his conversions by cannibalizing a variety of bits 
from Citadel halls, with the sole exception of his forward observer, easily identifiable by the aircraft propeller protruding from the rear of the figure. Dave used the midsection of a Citadel Dalek to form the attachment between the body and the blade. A pistol sight was added to the top of the figure's weapon to make it look like a target designator. Another of Dave's figures makes use of a bike from the Judge Dredd figures, whilst another weird creation has a Marine's torso sat atop a Dalek's body. An effective but simple job. To create the bazooka figure, Dave simply fixed a torso at right angles to a set of legs. This left a wedge between the figure's body and lower half, but this wouldn't be important as it would not be visible once the figure had been mounted. The bazooka itself was simply made up of bits of sprue from the kit itself. A head cut from one of the metal orc figures was added to another marine, whose legs were filed and shortened to give the effect of orcish proportions. Finally, the orc's metal bayonet was attached to the shoulder piece for that baroque feel. The sniper was a standard space marine whose weapons were embellished by adding various bits from other guns in the pack. Another figure was given an orc's head and converted hand flamer. The whole thing was topped off with a row of rockets for a heavy duty look, while the guardian was simply embellished with a plastic shield and another bayonet equipped shoulder pad. Ali Morrison made the most subtle alterations to his group of space marines. Most of his figures were constructed straight from the box. However, to accentuate some of the poses, Ali used a tube of Bostic-like adhesive and small amounts of body putty, applying small amounts to each of the sections to be attached. When this was nearly touch dry, the necessary joints were made. The elasticity of the cement allowed arms to be fitted to the main body and then moved slightly to ensure weapons would be grasped correctly. The putty was applied to larger areas, such as torso joints, because it could fill any unsightly gaps in the finished construction. When the desired pose was achieved, Superglue was run into the joins for extra strength. The actual conversions were very subtle. On the flamethrower, a hand and grip were repositioned underneath the weapon for a more effective pose. Again, to give character to Ali's Inquisitor, the legs were filed and brought closer together to make the figure taller and more imposing. And the figure's faceplate was altered in the same manner as Nick Bibby's skull mask conversion. Pouches taken from easily available Japanese model kits were added to the model for that touch of individuality. Painting began with an overall red undercoat. Layers of red were painted over the top to bring out the strength and depth of the colour. A brighter, more fiery red could be achieved by applying yellow undercoat. Finally, two stages of washing and highlighting brought out the detail. In the case of the Inquisitor, a black base colour was worked up with a dark blue paint mix. Insignia were penciled in before being painted over in the required colours and the metallic areas of the figures were given a peat brown ink wash for a slightly rusty finish. The dramatic camouflage scheme applied to the group leader was achieved by working up three tones from yellow to brown which were painted all over the body. A lighter modelling was dabbed over this before shading with brown ink and highlighting. Strap detail was left clean. If you go to the trouble of painting a complex looking camouflage scheme onto a figure as small as this and then try highlighting and shading every detail, the result will look messy. It's far better to emphasise one aspect or the other. The banner was made in a similar fashion to Nick's. However, the fringe across the bottom was painted first 
and then shredded with a scalpel blade and given a second coat. An important note here is that while Ali painted his camouflage scheme before shading, the effect he desired was that of a subtle bottling. Figure painter extraordinaire Sid, whose figures sported some distinctly esoteric camouflage schemes, added them after shading. The layered strips of colour that make his figures so striking would have been totally destroyed had any kind of wash been applied over the top. Sid used a base colour which was then shaded and highlighted in the usual way, taking inspiration from jungle and tiger stripe schemes used by military units past and present. Jagged black lines were painted across the body and then worked up with thinner, brighter tones. The figures speak for themselves. The potential for new camouflage schemes is limited only by your imagination. Who's to say what colours will be necessary to blend in to some strange alien landscape? The main guide is to use complementary colouring. Some interesting ideas can be found in the unlikeliest of places. Mike Brunton's subtle Winter Trooper was inspired by World War II Eastern Front vehicle camouflage schemes. The base colour was a neutral green. After insignia and other detailing was added, Mike used elf and ghoul grey, mixed to varying degrees with white in graduated and streaky washes to make it look like a hurried repainting that had worn in some places and been scrubbed off in others, like on the insignia. We call this whitewashing. A glance through a military modelling book can provide similar inspiration, especially if it depicts World War II German camouflage schemes or modern NATO patterning. Even if you only use the pattern but change the colouring, your figures are likely to acquire striking individuality. And while we're on the subject of inspiration, the shoulder insignia Mike chose, four red diamonds, is in fact a clan symbol from Japanese history. If you're inventing new chapters, simple but effective markings like these can really make your figures something special. As an example of what can be done, we've included the painting guide for the Ultramarine chapter of Space Marines from Warhammer 40,000. Now it's up to you. If you think you have discovered an exciting and dramatic conversion or painting style for your Space Marines, get in touch and tell us why. There must be an almost inexhaustible range of possibilities out there, somewhere. By John Blanche and Sean Masterson. Thank you very much for watching. If you'd like to support the channel, then please be sure to like and subscribe, or even leave a comment. I always try my best to reply to them all. You can even now support the channel by joining the Patreon page, details of which are in the description below. Thank you again for watching, and always remember to drill your barrels.